Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by Todd Egan, who has over 10 years experience in the Sales Ops world. He's currently running Sales Ops at a business called Secure Works. So Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's kick things off and understand first how you managed to find your way into the world of sales operations. Yeah, it's a bit of a um, different journey than most people. Um, so I did that out of school for about six years, uh, six, seven years. And then from there, um, I moved into the uh, white collar space of uh, customer service, so call center and, and whatnot, and then moved into an implementation the main part of it was Melbourne, and we were, and I sort of got a role into their sales team, and that was looking after um, the Telstra account. So we had sort of three sales support people. That that account was quite a big, um, uh, big revenue spin for for Dimension Data Australia. It was about 17, 18 million um, in, in annual revenue. So it was split in, into three sort of areas, and and that was my first forte in mainly to sales operations the side of things of managing um, from vendor relationships, distribution, reseller, um, margin control, quotes. Um, so sort of um, got into all that area. Uh, from there, went back into, um, into the UK uh, with my partner, who's actually from, from the UK, um, and decided to move back to London and then worked at uh, Cisco um, underneath. Um, they just acquired uh, ScanSafe. Uh, looking after resellers in um, in France and Belgium and and the UK um, on that area, and then from there moved to a smaller sort of startup called Control Circle. Um, that sort of do um, they were like a, a bit of a, a telco um, in terms of uh, uh, line sort of distribution from data centers. Um, so I was there, and that that was probably my first forte in terms of forecast management. Um, more margin control and going from like the start of marketing all the way through the uh, model. Uh, and then sort of did a bit of a deviation off there to an insurance company, which didn't really sort of work out. And then found myself at SecureWorks, um, found myself at SecureWorks uh, six years ago and absolutely love, love the role. It's ever-changing our business. Um, so SecureWorks are part of... Um, uh, dimension data. Oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Um, they're part of the Dell Technology Group, and um, it's they used to be uh, at the start when they acquired um, SecureWorks. They were actually going to be embedded into a into their program, um, into embedded into their vendor program. Um, so yeah, so that was how my my sort of role. So sort of gone from working outdoors mowing lawns to uh, to now running. Um, you know. A, Start operations role, uh, looking after the you know, third and sellers um, in EMEA. Got it. Um, and now to zoom in on SecureWorks, how many reps are you currently running and what, what's the size of the operations team? Yeah, so the operations team, there's four of us. Um, or I, I manage four people, so there's five of us in total. Uh, we, we provide support to 37 sellers within EMEA, so that's across the Nordics, Benelux, uh, UK, Ireland, Germany, and the Middle East. And um, essentially, my team is broken down into, into two sort of areas. So we've got three people that sort of provide day-to-day -day support, and it's more like guidance, if anything. So it's around pipeline management, um, uh, opportunity creation, and, and opportunity management within Salesforce. And then also have a renewals person or renewals manager who basically looks after all of our in-store based customers from a renewal point of view. We're currently diversifying to a SaaS sort of model at the moment. So we sell standard managed security services and now we're sort of going into the software space. So it's a bit of a transformation period and we provide guidance on how they can articulate their, um, uh, their, their solutions to, to, to our customers. Got it. Awesome. So I, I think I had about five in the ops team, and then you're supporting around 37 reps around Amir. Correct, yes. Got it. Awesome. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the tech stack that you're currently running at SecureWorks? 
Yeah, so it's quite diversified. <laughs> um, so um, I'll, I'll sort of break it in because different teams have different sort of, but they all sort of intertwine with each other. So, for instance, um, we will work with our marketing team who have, I believe, our Zoom Info, our Eloqua, uh, Six Sense, and they have another one called Demand Base. Um, all of them as like marketing intel, um, providing um, intelligence on when uh, um, a client has downloaded a white paper, um, you know, jumped on a podcast or, or a webcast for us, has touched our um, our website, and what are they what are they sort of looking for? Um, and then from that, we can feed that back into our DGR team, who also use uh, I think it's called um, Sales Loft for. Uh, for calling um, and and uh, and tracking purposes, um, they also use LinkedIn Navigator and also what was the other one? Um, LinkedIn Navigator and oh and um, uh, Discover Org also too. They use from a tech stack. So so all those inter- integrate into Salesforce as our overarching um, uh, CRM tool, and we also have Workday on top of that from a finance. Um, and a billing CRM um, area too. So those are our main areas. Uh, we also use Tableau as a virtual uh, visualization tool for reporting. Got on. I didn't catch. Are you guys currently using Salesforce? Correct. Yeah, we're in the middle of actually transitioning to Salesforce Lightning. Um, so we just have a. We're, we're just in that sort of period at the moment of, of moving um, our products. Um, from from one area to the other. Got it. Makes sense. Um, awesome. And then I want to talk a little bit about these reps. So 37, do you, as a team, do you maintain one-on-one relationships with every single rep? Like do you work individ- individually with them? No. That's a really good question. So um, so when I first started, it, it was literally on an ad hoc basis. I sort of felt that in other organizations that I worked at, having a more intimate relationship was a, was of a much better value to a the rep and also um it, it made the sales operations person more like they're part of that team when there's say a big deal of on, on board they can sort of work almost like in a deal desk um function um so so we structure the team as a, it's basically a 10 to 1 ratio um it's about 11 to 1 sort of thing um really um, and we break that up in terms of I look at it from a personality point of view. So I look at, um, I, I really try and get to know my, my sellers and then I marry up against the personality of my team too. Um, and also I've got quite a long tenured team. So um, I've had, I've got two people that have been with us for over seven years. I've got another person there for four years and one other for like two and a half years. So I've got a quite an experienced team. Um, and we, what I try and do is also try and change it up year over year and make those people move around so they can integrate with different experiences within different countries because every country is different how they sell you know, uh, legislation or laws that you have for selling cyber security. Um, so it's good for them to get that um, experience in, in different regions and how those sellers um, transact their business. Got it. And so did you say 11 to 1 as in 11 reps to 1 sales ops person? Correct. Yeah, yeah, and we're, a lot of a lot of our a lot of our sellers are uh, they know the process around forecasting, pipeline management. Um, it, it's there, but we're more there as a guidance for them. Um, and if on the bigger complex deals, we will really get stuck into and, and sort of helping them construct their deals in that manner. But we, we try and have a business where the sellers or account managers are, are essentially self enabled. Cool. Awesome. Okay. And so the next question is, do you have any tips on onboarding reps? Um, yeah, so I think um, getting to know the, the reps, where, where they've been. Um, I, I always look at it this way that, that you learn off everyone that you meet um, and you never stop learning. So whether they're uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a pre-sales person. So we onboard pre-sales guys too because they obviously utilise our, our tech stack um, from, a, from a Salesforce um, point of view, so we I think that's really important is getting to understand the individual, um, especially in different countries, um, understand their challenges, getting to them to know um, 
how our business runs. Um, every business is different. And then just listen to, you know, what, um, what changes we can make. I think sometimes when you're in long tenure, you know, in a company, you can be quite um, uh, blinkered in terms of what other people think and think that the way that you do things day in, day out is the right way. Um, and I think it's important to, to listen to, uh, to, to other people and sort of see if, that, if their experiences or what they did at another company can actually be, um, can be utilised um, and, and improved within, within our own business processes. Got it. So you're saying that just as you can educate the rep on how you guys work and your best practices, there's also a lot to learn from the rep themselves. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Got it. And can you, this might be a tricky question, but have the, can you share a time of when a, rep, a new rep have come in and then taught you guys something that's helped and changed your process? Um, that is a tricky question. I think um, every rep will, will sort of question, say, um, if you talk around forecasting, um, everyone's got an opinion on forecasting. There's different models out there. Um, uh, for instance, you know, we had a, a new um, Middle East um, sales director that's just come on board and, and he was going to potentially do it a different way to what we had. We, we already went down the, the way. It was not, there's no right or wrong ways, it's just what we follow at this present time and, and it was more having an offline conversation with him um, to, to basically say, I, you know, I understand exactly what you're, what you're going on about. This is just how we do things in a more simplified manner um, and getting buy-in, but just taking um, his experiences on board and, you know, and making sure that in the back of my mind we're actually doing things the, the right way um, also. Got it. Makes sense. And now actually moving on to your forecasting process. Um, how does that work? Who's involved? Yeah, so it's so I, I report into um, the VP of Global Sales Operations, um, and they're based in, in Atlanta. So they made a decision um, probably about halfway last year. So we used to have a model where it was, it was sort of quite simple. It was um, basically you know you had your upside, strong upside, and um, and commit as your three pillars of forecasting. Uh, I think they felt that there was too many grey areas and people were um, utilising, you know, upside and strong upside in the manner that they weren't really sort of all in on the commit side and, and, and that. So what they decided to do was have, we renamed it to expect and coverage. So essentially... Nice. You, if you tick the boxes, expect that's that's you're committing. Like right? you're all in for the quarter, um, and and we build our 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 sort of um, our win number um, or our close number to to that number. And coverage is basically everything else. So it falls outside the bucket if it has a close date within the quarter that is in the coverage. So that if that expect box not ticked. Um, so you can get quite a big distinction on, um, and you also know where um, uh, what, what your what your bucket is, what your what your pipeline is for, for the quarter. So, uh, and the, and the, we have regular um, we have a forecast call every every Monday um, with our sales directors, and we, we go through quite a, a rigid questioning process with them on on qualification, uh, where it's at, who are the key stakeholders. Um, that make those decisions to get to basically move those deals from a coverage point of view into the expect area. Um, and then we also walk through, we have a closed plan review also too on those cover on the expect deals to make sure that there's no slippages, the client actually understands the, the path to, to close. Um, so we're quite transparent um, through with the client and also with within our business. And then we also have a, um, a another call on that where we relate our regional forecast up to the to the global um, or into my boss with the VP of sales op, global sales operations and formulate that number and then that goes rolls up to the ELT. Got it. Okay, there's a lot to unwrap there. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> you changed three different stages into the two. So if I'm a rep and I'm very confident a deal is going to come in this quarter, I put I tick expect. Correct. Then, if I have a coverage deal, which is the other category, with a close date in that quarter, then that's also added into the, the number that you guys use to forecast. Good. Correct. So it's two, it's two buckets. So instead of having three buckets beforehand and then, or actually essentially four buckets, 
um, because if it's not, if it wasn't in upside, strong upside, or or commit, it's sort of like outside that region it still formulates if it has a close date. Um, so you, so what the business did was just simplify it to have to expect and coverage. So essentially, it's uh, it's I find it quite simple. It was a bit hard to get your head wrapped around it, but it is sort of simplistic in nature. Got it. And then you the, the weekly call with the sales directors where you're looking at all the deals and then you anything that isn't expect, you'd work on a close plan and ensure that the clients are aware of the close plan. We do try. We 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 encourage our sellers to to make to be quite transparent. So if they put something in cut in into expect, it is it, the, the the questioning is then around like, are you sticking to that date that's listed in Salesforce? Um is the client aware of that date or their timelines? Um, have they gone through their procedures in terms of, um, you know, budget sign-off, um, who's available to sign um, our, our documents um, and and what's their process in terms of their um, purchase order uh, creation? So I think it's essential for sellers to, to understand those key components. They're, they're probably not the nicest of things to ask, to be honest, but I think it's really essential for sellers to, um, to understand their clients' internal processes on how long something goes through their, their approval um, procurement system and if they have any challenges. So then, you know, you can better forecast uh, uh, upon when that deal will close in the system. Got it. Okay. And I think, I think this is a really important point. And I, I'm not that experienced in sales, but I don't think that many people actually do that. It's really when you're getting to to the close, like learning from the client exactly what things need to happen in order for the deal to close and what the timeline normally is. I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's, it is a hard thing. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a learning curve and, and I don't, I think it's been something that we've developed over the last couple of years to, to be honest. And, and I think some, I, I probably might speak out of turn, but I, I feel a lot of um, reps would have, um, that they might feel that's a bit of an uncomfortable conversation and if it, that puts the deal in jeopardy. But I don't feel it does. I think it shows that you're interested in their business. You you want to understand their timeline so you're not constantly asking the question of, you know, who has to sign it, where are they, you know, you said it last week. It's it's essentially you're, you're getting a commitment from them. You're working towards an agreed time frame and you're just following up on the steps on how to take it and you're feeding that back into the business too for a, for a much better and a more accurate forecast. Yeah, exactly. So it's just like reps won't do it because they're scared it's going to hurt the deal, but actually it probably helps the deal for both sides. Um, oh, absolutely. Cool. Okay. And then next question is, if you could only measure one sales metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? That's a really good question. Um and I had a bit of time to think about this, and it might be a little bit outside the box, but I think pipeline growth is really important. If you don't have pipeline, if you don't have a strong pipeline, you're never going to close those deals or get to your number. So we work off, uh, you know, a, a, a 3.5 growth rate with our sellers on pipeline. So, um, and and I think for a business to be healthy, you need to have that big pipeline. Um, so we have West done have um, a lot more regular in depth reviews around pipeline growth. We call it the pipeline walk, um, and 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 I think it's good from from that metric too, Tom. Is that you can you, you can do year over year reviews, so you can actually see. But like we've got a we you know in Tableau we we can actually um, put our data in there. We can actually see or question say what. The growth, what the pipeline growth was um, in Q1 last year against where we're at right now, and we can see as a business, are we are we growing in the manner that we should be? And I think pipeline does sort of you know show a lot more indications of how healthy your business is. Got it. And just so I understand, so a three point five growth rate on pipeline. Does that mean say if in October this year your pipeline is worth one million, you you would expect it the previous year to be. 3.5 times less than that? No, no sorry. So, sorry. Um, so if you're, if a seller's got their quota at one mil, you would want their pipeline to be three, three, um, three and a half mil. So got they've it. got enough in their pipeline to actually get to their quota number. 
So if someone is is got a target of one mil, but they're only got a half a million in pipeline, that they they're going to struggle. Um, that means that they're they're all in, or they need to find you know another half mil and, and commit it to, to close their number. So that's sort of the, um, the 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 metric that we work on. Got it. So then, at any one time, you can look at the total pipeline of all reps, and then you can look at each rep individual pipeline and understand like how close you are. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's really, it's a good metric for sales directors to have those one-to-one conversations and, and enforce that coaching methodology in there. You can find out, you know, is it a territory issue? Is it a rep issue? Is it a product issue? Um, you know, and they can start to unravel on, on why maybe their pipeline isn't to the, the value that it should be. Um, because they're just, you know, we want all our sellers to be successful. Um, you don't want to see anyone um, sort of not hitting their quota. So those metrics are really important to sort of unravel um, how those sellers are successful. Got it. Makes sense. And the final question, who has been your biggest sales ops-related inspiration? Uh, there's actually a few over the years. Um and I think it's funny because people will talk about, um, and I've listened to uh, a few people on, the, on, the, on your podcast, and I think people always relate to people that are in sales ops. And to me, I, I look at more, say, like my sales, um, my VP of sales, um, Ian Bancroft, who's probably been the one that's taken me to a different level um, and challenged what, what we do or what I do personally. So it's it's looking more in depth into the metrics. Um, how can you improve um, or enable sellers? And being his right hand right hand man on terms of um, where the business is heading and giving him that insight that he may may not have. Um, he's probably been my my biggest um, sort of you know um, mentor at the moment, if you want to call it that. And it's quite funny because he's more of a sales director VP. But, um, yeah, I, I say currently it would, it would be him. Got it. And do you want to shout out to any of the others or are we just shouting out to uh, Yeah, and, and no, no. And there's an, um, probably the, in, when I let Dimension Data, um, uh, my manager there, Louis Petrov, um, he's been with Dimension Data for like 20 years. Um, absolutely lovely guy. Um, and he, he just took the time to, if you're coming into sales ops, it, it, it's quite it's quite all-encompassing. You, you sort of touch a lot of um, – you are the hub of the business, I feel. So you touch marketing, product, pre-sales, sales, um, and depending on what your what your business streams are, you know, you can touch in a reseller area, distribution. Um, so – and then also you've got your, your clients there, whereas uh, Louis, Louis sort of um, – before this experience, just broke it down really simplistic for us step by step. Um, focus on one thing at a time sort of thing and don't become um, overawed by by where your touch points have to get to. And he's also very big on making sure that you make your internal, like build your internal stakeholder relationships. So your keys are like, you know, finance, product, marketing, um, having a good relationship with your with your sellers. Um so it's uh, it, it's that they that was the main key point from from him was always like make sure that your relationships are solid internally because they will help you in times where a client is uh, quite quite um challenging and uh, and you can all band together to get to the you know the common outcome that you need to get to and he was he was very good at enforcing that. Got it. So shout out to Louis and Ian. Um, yes. So let me quickly share a few things that I liked. I've never actually heard before how you can learn from other reps experience in onboarding to tweak your process. And I think that's a really good like mindset shift for anyone in sales ops. I like how you guys have uh, kind of really simplified your pipeline status, whereas there's just two different areas and, and that probably makes forecasting much <laughs> like a much more simple process. And then finally, the quite simplistic metric you gave, but is, is actually a really good snapshot that any sales or sales ops person can take of the business to see the health of the sales process and each rep broken down by territory, et cetera. So those are the things I liked. 
Yeah, they're, they're really, I, I, I think you captured it really well. And, and you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I was listening to, I think it was uh, one of your most recent ones and, uh, you know, win rate is really important um, and, and it's hard to capture win rate too, but I, I do find that's important. But when I sort of reviewed, um, you know, that KPI metric, I just think pipeline is is such a key key metric that I think a lot of people um, potentially undervalue and don't talk about as as prominently. But if you're if you don't have a healthy pipeline in the business, it, it's not you know you're, you're sort of uh, you know it's uh yeah it's a it's a long long climb up the hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Todd, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. No worries, thanks, Tom. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>